Good evening, and welcome to Skeptics in the Pub Online. I am Brian Eggle, and I'll be cradling you this evening while our speaker feeds you some tasty science, scepticism, and critical thinking. We are here to nourish you every second and fourth Thursday of the month, and if that's not enough to satisfy your voracious appetites, then you can feast on our back catalogue on our YouTube channel or our podcast. There's plenty of other ways to engage with us and support us too, and our mods will be sprinkling that information into the text chat throughout the talk. Before we dive in tonight, though, a couple of announcements. So I'm sure most of you are already aware of the creme de la creme of sceptical conferences coming back to Manchester on the 29th and 30th of October. If you weren't aware, get with the programme. QEDCon.org, tickets selling fast. So firstly... We at SITP Online have got a great initiative to help people who might otherwise struggle to afford it make it to the conference. So if you've got a few quid to spare, then you can donate to the cause. Or if you're on the flip side and you're a little bit skinto, then you can apply to be one of the beneficiaries of those donations and get yourselves to QED. For more information to donate and to apply, go to sitp.online forward slash QED. Secondly, and this is an exclusive, grab onto your seats, folks. The Skeptics in the Pub online team are going to be hosting this year's traditional free Skeptic Camp on the eve of QED. So that's Friday the 28th of October in the same venue as QED. That's the Mercure Cadilly Hotel in Manchester. You can go along even if you don't have a ticket for the full conference. And you have the chance to be the stars as well, because we're looking for people who think they've got something of interest to present there. If you think you've got what it takes to deliver a short, snappy talk at Skeptic Camp, then you can find out more and apply at sitp.online forward slash Skeptic Camp. Okay, on to tonight on the strangely controversial topic of feeding children. It's the usual format. Our speaker is going to pump you full of information for about 45 minutes, after which we take a short break and then we're back for Q&A. The chat area in Twitch is for polite, witty banter. But if you want to ask a question and upvote existing questions, then please go to sitp.online forward slash ask. Our speaker for this evening, just when you think things couldn't get more Scottish, we're going to be testing the Twitch closed captions to the limit tonight. Dr. Erin Williams is a reproductive biologist at the University of Edinburgh and co-founder of the independent feeding charity Feed. She has battled through COVID, the joys of childcare and the woes of living in Ayrshire just to be with you this evening. So please go wild in the text chat and Twitch. Erin, the floor is yours. Please go for it. Thank you very much, Will. That is an introduction and a half. I will try to use my posh lecturer voice, but if anybody would like me to clarify anything in my lovely Ayrshire accent, I will do so. So I'm here tonight to take you on a bit of a whistle-stop tour through the world of infant feeding, which you might be surprised to discover is actually fraught with facts, fictions, pseudoscience, claims, debunking and a lot of debate. So I'm here in my capacity as the co-founder of Feed and you'll see there in the screen our hashtag is bottles, boobs or tubes and that's because our aim is to provide infant feeding support and advice to families regardless of how they feed their babies. And the pictures on the screen there are me and my three babies and you'll see that I have fed them with bottles, boobs and tubes. So my personal experience, as well as my professional experience as a reproductive biologist, has kind of spanned the spectrum of infant feeding. So just a wee bit more about me. As I say, I'm a reproductive biologist, which basically means that I teach, study and lead a research group in the field of reproductive biology. And my main interest is in postpartum health and fertility. So that's after you've given birth. And that's the time, obviously, when women and other animals are feeding their babies. So I'm really interested in lactation physiology. And you can see me there with uh, some cows because I've done a lot of work with dairy cattle, who are the athletes of the infant feeding world. They produce lots of milk for us to enjoy in our tea and our cornflakes. And a lot of what we know about infant um, about lactation physiology comes from studies and dairy cattle. So I try to apply some of my knowledge from working with the cows to um, when I'm 
working through the science and the evidence and the claims around infant feeding in humans. As I mentioned, I have two wee ones of my own, so I've got personal experience of the infant feeding world and I've joined together with some other fantastic women to co-found Feed. I just want to make it clear as well that Feed is completely independent, we've got no financial conflicts of interest and we don't speak in behalf or work for any other infant feeding organisation. And we've never accepted any money from any companies that profit from infant feeding and that includes formula feeding companies, breast pump manufacturers, etc. And we never will. We're completely independent and our sole remit is to support families with best evidence, unbiased support and policies that are inclusive and, and help everybody. So, as I said, I'm going to take you on a whistle stop tour of infant feeding and specifically within the UK. And that's really important because a lot of the stuff I'm talking about is UK specific and I'm well aware that in other parts of the world um, advice might be different depending on the resources and the scenarios that families are living in. So we're stuck into the UK just now. So to introduce you to the concept of infant feeding, I'll just give you a wee bit of background about what the UK infant feeding landscape is like at the moment. So predominantly infant feeding support and education is the remit of the NHS. It makes sense um, when you find yourself pregnant, you go to your local GP or midwife and you start on the pathway of antenatal care. And at the very first or one of the very earliest midwife appointments, you'll get given a huge big folder with loads of information in it. And a lot of that will be about infant feeding and how we feed our babies. And there are classes you can go to and um, online resources that you can look up to help you make your decision as to how you want to feed your baby and to give you tips and kind of ideas as to what you might expect. So the NHS predominantly outsources, if you like, its infant feeding education to UNICEF. And they do this through what's called the Baby Friendly Initiative or the BFI. And that just means that they produce the training resources for NHS staff and they provide a lot of the information to the NHS so that they can support women as they go through their pregnancy and postpartum time with infant feeding. And the NHS then can become accredited. So different health boards, maternity units, community health visiting teams, and now also paediatric units and universities can go for baby friendly accreditation. So they have to demonstrate that they meet a certain criteria to UNICEF and they'll get awarded either a gold, silver or bronze award. And then they have to keep that up each year to maintain their accreditation. As well as the kind of official, if you like, infant feeding support, there's also a number of third sector organisations and countless um, volunteer and local parent and toddler groups, that kind of thing, where you can go for infant feeding support. And some of the most predominant ones there are NCT, which I think have a partnership with the NHS, but I'm not quite sure what the status of that is at the moment. You've got La Leche League and the Breastfeeding Network, Breastfeeding Helpline, and lots and lots of local community groups. So there's a whole host of areas that a mum or a parent can go to to get information and infant feeding. And of course, the internet is one of the key places. But I think it is fair to say that all of these organisations, or the vast majority of them anyway, are largely committed to promoting breastfeeding as the optimum choice for babies. So just another wee bit of information about Baby Friendly Initiative. As I said, um, maternity units can become accredited. And in 2018, in Scotland, we were the first country in the United Kingdom for all of our maternity units to be baby friendly accredited. And I think at the last time I checked, there was over 90% of maternity units in the rest of the UK going for this accreditation or working towards accreditation. In 2020, I think it was, 
the NHS long-term plan included the goal of having every maternity unit in the UK baby-friendly accredited. So it's safe to say that if you have just had or you're going to have a baby, your infant feeding education is going to come under this baby-friendly initiative scheme. So one of the key tenets of the baby-friendly initiative is to promote breastfeeding. And they have their 10 steps to successful breastfeeding. I'll them all out individually to you, but you can see they largely make sense. You know, you should have a breastfeeding policy. Your staff need to be trained in the skills. Um, pregnant women should be informed about the benefits and management of breastfeeding. You should help them get it started, etc. There are a couple in there that some people have questioned. For example, number six states that newborn infants shouldn't have any food or drink other than breast milk unless medically indicated. Um, and I'll come back to that later on. And also no artificial teats or dummies as well, because we don't want the babies to get confused between the bottle or the dummy and um, the breast. So this is the, the kind of remit that the NHS are working under. And there's additional standards for each individual unit that they have to meet as a unit as well. So what do women get when they, they rock up to the midwife? Well, these are the materials that I got in 2020 when I was pregnant. And this on the left hand side is my breastfeeding and formula feeding information. So I don't know if you can see um, too clearly, but the breastfeeding booklet is nice and big. It was in really lovely, glossy paper, lots of nice colours. It talks about the first magical hour. Say hello to your baby. You're off to a good start. Nice, smiley mum on the front page there. Look at that dad, absolutely delighted looking at his new baby. And then we also got given the formula feeding information leaflet, which is smaller. It's on that kind of off-white recycled type rough paper that you get and you can see that it's not quite as smiley or happy there's no people in the front of it um, and it's talking not about the magical hours with your baby or getting feeding off to a good start it's talking about safety we also got the baby box in Scotland which is a, an initiative from the, any, uh, the Scottish government and that gives families everything they need really for a newborn baby so it's got things like clothes and thermometers nappies and there's information in there about breastfeeding but there's no information about formula feeding or bottle feeding within that box so already I don't know if you're maybe beginning to see all oh, the messaging here is kind of swaying um, in favour of breastfeeding. It's looking very much like breastfeeding is something that's good and to be supported and promoted and formula feeding is something that we have to consider in terms of safety. When you open up the booklet, that um, difference is, is even starker. So the top left-hand one there is within the breastfeeding booklet and that shows you um, what's in formula and the small towel there, Lego tower, and what's in breast milk. And if you zoomed in, you would see that that's talking about um, all the wonderful things that breast milk has in it that formula doesn't, which is you know, perfectly true. If you then go to the top right hand side and have a look at the guidance in the formula feeding booklet, you'll see there's a lot of these big danger signs, safety first, um, you know, danger, danger, high voltage. And these kind of images are on almost every page. Safety first, safety first, don't do this or it might be risky, don't do that. Um, very much a different vibe reading the formula feeding book. You know, you'd almost be terrified to formula feed your baby after reading this booklet. And I don't know what the, um, the guidance was given to the graphic designer who designed the formula feeding booklet, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was make this look as dull, old fashioned and unappealing as possible. The contrast in the two booklets is, is quite stark when you see it. And down here on the bottom left hand side, I've actually put the two books side by side showing the same information. So the big booklet is the breastfeeding booklet and that's showing you what cues your baby might show you when they're hungry. There's lots of clear pictures with lots of, um, you know, clear statements 
an advice and a nice picture of a, a happy mum and baby there, whereas, um, you know, there's much less information there and kind of the pictures are all squashed together, so they're not quite as clear in the formula feeding booklet. And these on the bottom right hand side are some posters that were in the maternity hospital that we went to. And again, it just echoes this um, healthy future, good start benefits of breastfeeding. So very much the picture that you get as a mum, both I would agree from a personal experience and also from what the research tells us that mums say about infant feeding support is that breastfeeding is very much um, positioned as the best thing to do, that it's encouraged, lots of support and formula feeding is not. So that's kind of the background with which um, we have to look at the, the claims around infant feeding. So the context in which we approach the data is also, um, you know, this whole idea of essentially breast is best. So what are the claims then? Why are the NHS and UNICEF and all of these other big organisations really pushing women to breastfeed? Well, it's because breastfeeding improves maternal and infant health. So if you breastfeed, your baby's health will be improved and your health will be improved. That is the claim that is made. Now, I have trolled the internet and had a made this list of things that have been claimed to be um, benefits of breastfeeding. So again, you'll see that there's quite a lot of them. So the top shows the benefits to the baby. So there's reductions in things like infection, asthma, obesity, diabetes, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. An increase in things like IQ, speech development, glossy hair. I was quite surprised <laughs> when I read that one. So if you breastfeed your babies, they'll have nice glossy hair. Um, so that, that was a new one in me. Um, smoother and more supple skin as well was another one that, that I found. Portability. It's easier to take a baby than it is to carry a baby in lots of bottles and formula and all that kind of stuff. Um, your babies will grow up to be more independent and have stronger bones if they're breastfed. And these come from um, different websites, including the NHS, the NCT, 10steps.org, and some other popular parenting feeding blogs and advice pages online. For mum then, she's not going to be as high risk for things like Diabetes, reproductive cancers, including breast, ovarian and uterine cancer, um, depression and anxiety are said to be reduced. Um, she'll have less time off work because both her and her baby will be more healthy. And even better in this day and age, she will reduce her environmental footprint because she's not using plastic bottles and tubs of formula and all that kind of stuff. And she'll be thinner, happier, more relaxed. She'll bond better with her baby. She'll have more free time because she doesn't need to be standing at the sink washing bottles. Um, life will just be handier because she's not got all that faff of bottle feeding. Some claim that if you've breastfed your baby, they're easier to parent when they are toddlers. And can I just say, as the parent of a toddler, I absolutely refute that <laughs> from my own experience. But overall, um, she'll be more self-confident. So when you look at this list, this score sheet of the benefits of breastfeeding, coming off the back of your antenatal education where experts and healthcare providers are telling you effectively breast is best, maybe not in those exact words, but effectively breast is best, you would be forgiven for thinking, you know, this is absolutely too good to be true, this as liquid gold but unfortunately I am going to have to let you into a secret it is too good to be true why is that well all you skeptics out there will be familiar with this evidence pyramid so for anybody that's not seen this before this pyramid shows the different types of evidence that we use to support our claims. And the higher up the pyramid you go, the 
stronger or more robust the data is. So we can be more confident in a claim that is supported by evidence within a systematic review than we could from, say, a case control study or an expert opinion. So the reason I showed this is because, as the pink arrow shows, the studies that have resulted in the claims in the previous slide mostly reside in the lower part of the pyramid. So because we can really randomise babies into breastfeeding and formula feeding groups, we have to rely on mainly cohort studies and case control studies. So that's where we would either do a prospective study where we follow a group of babies from their birth for a few years and look at the different outcomes and then compare breastfed versus formula fed babies. Or we do a retrospective study where we take a group of adults, teenagers or children, look at their performance and their health indicators for certain things and then go back and think, right, how was this person fed as a baby? And then we compare breastfed versus formula fed. And lo and behold, quite a lot of the claims from the previous slide are supported. Not all of them, some of the ones in that previous slide, actually, I couldn't find any evidence to support or refute. Um, so they would just be people's opinions. I'm assuming glossy here is <laughs> just an opinion. So while we do have studies that show a lot of the benefits of breastfeeding, the actual robustness of that data is limited. So what we need to do is we need to try and do studies that remove a lot of the confounders. Because if you're comparing breastfed babies to non-breastfed babies, you're also comparing different families. And we know from data that women who breastfeed their babies tend to have a higher social economic status, they've got higher household income, they tend to be higher educated and less likely to be living in poverty, whereas um, formula fed babies tend to be the opposite. So how do we know that when we compare breastfed versus formula fed, we're not just comparing all these other um, confounders, if you like? So to try and actually dig down and see if there is a causal effect of breastfeeding on health, behavioural and other indicators that we might be interested in, we really have to try and design studies that take into account or correct for all these different confounders. So you can see I've listed the ones I could think of off the top of my head here. Um, maternal education, social economic status and poverty are particularly strong um, confounders as a social support. So basically, are we looking at correlation or are we looking at causation? I'm not really sure. And as I mentioned before, it's really hard to do, you know, what we think about as the gold standard is the randomised control trial because we can't say, right, you can formula feed your baby, you breastfeed your baby. That's not going to work. But luckily, there has been some studies that have tried to get around this and correct for all these confounding factors. So the first one and one of the most well-known in the infant feeding research world is the PROBIT randomised control trial. So that's a promotional breastfeeding intervention trial. And they didn't actually randomise babies to breastfeeding versus formula feeding. But what they did do was they randomised them to breastfeeding support. So they took 17,000 mother-infant pairs and half of them randomly were given extra breastfeeding support and the other half weren't. And you can see that actually giving women good breastfeeding support increases the number of babies that are exclusively breastfed at three months old and that are receiving any breastfeeding at a year old. So the intervention or the randomization um, does work to improve the incidence of breastfeeding. But what does it do to the health, the outcomes for the babies? Well, when they compared breastfed babies to formula-fed babies, they found that actually once you control for a lot of the confounders, 
there are still fewer gastrointestinal infections, fewer cases of diarrhoea, and less eczema and rashes in breastfed babies compared to their non-breastfed counterparts. However, in this particular study, they didn't find any differences between the groups and things like respiratory and ear infections and a host of other um, a host of other factors that they looked at. So we're still seeing some benefits that are supported by this kind of randomization, randomized control trial. But what we still have between family factors. So how do we know that the the families that did end up breastfeeding, you know, weren't higher social economic status, higher maternal education, etc. How do we control for all of that? And I suppose a really good way to do that would be if you could have groups of siblings where one sibling was breastfed and the other sibling wasn't, because then you're taking away any confounders. You know, they've got the same parents, they've got the same family set up, the same area etc. And lo and behold, luckily for us, some researchers have actually started to do that in the last few years. So what they've done is they've gone and they've looked at siblings where either one sibling was breastfed and one sibling was not breastfed, or maybe one was breastfed for much longer than the other. And then they've done the comparisons between breastfed and non-breastfed babies between families and also within the families as well, where you would expect that you've managed to get rid of most, if not all, of the confounding. I wouldn't say all, but most of the confounders. So one of the most popular studies that's been done with siblings is by Colin and Ramey in 2014. And what they found when they did this type of analysis was when you compare breastfed versus non-breastfed babies overall, 10 of the 11 things that they looked at did seem to be um, better in breastfed babies. So, for example, reduced BMI, reduced obesity, um, better at mass, better at reading, that kind of thing, when you looked at the children between 4 and 17 years old. However, when you did the within family analysis and corrected for all those confounders, all of these differences hugely reduced. Now, they didn't always go to zero. And actually, in some cases, they flipped and it looked like formula-fed babies were doing better, but none of them were actually significantly different. So when you correct for the confounders, um, you actually reduce quite a lot of the effects that we see. And just to take this even further, very briefly, there was another really great study where they looked at infants of mums who intended to breastfeed versus mums that didn't intend to breastfeed, regardless of whether they actually ended up breastfeeding or not. And what they found was that when a mum intended to breastfeed her baby, even if she didn't breastfeed them, the babies had fewer ear infections, fewer respiratory viruses, and they had reduced antibiotic use in the first year of life. So how, you know, what's the explanation for that? Well, the researchers went on to look at what's the difference between a mum that intended to breastfeed and a mum that didn't. And they found that mums who intended to breastfeed tended to have higher education, more access to health information, more access to their GP and other healthcare providers. So regardless of whether they ended up breastfeeding or not, it was um, more about the mum herself. So now we're starting to move up this evidence pyramid and we're seeing that when we go a bit higher up the pyramid, actually a lot of the claims for the benefits of breastfeeding are not supported in the data. So what does it mean? Well, as I said, the data doesn't support many of the claims, but that doesn't mean that the benefits are not real. We just don't have robust enough data to support them. So to a biological and physiological point of view, it makes absolute sense that breastfeeding is going to have a positive impact on your offspring. And the, breast, the data does show that for some of the short term outcomes, it seems to be more solid, a wee bit more shaky in some of the longer term health outcomes. So while it might have an effect 
we can't really support it with the data. And ultimately, a lot of it comes down to, to mammy magic. So it's factors that lead a woman to either intend to breastfeed or breastfeed that potentially are more important than the actual ingestion of breast milk itself. But in true scientist style, I'm going to say more studies are needed. So if we go back to this fantastic list, um, I've tried to kind of roughly give a guide as to, as we say in Ayrshire, I know, or maybe I, maybe it's not, in terms of where the data is taken as right now. So as I said, we can see for things like ear infections, respiratory infections, there's solid evidence that there is a benefit. There's also evidence of a reduced incidence of sudden infant death syndrome in breastfed babies, but the mechanism of that is not quite clear at the moment. Unfortunately, we cannot support glossy hair and smoother and more supple skin, but who knows, maybe one day the, the study will, will come to support that. And for mum, it's pretty clear now that there is a reduction in breast cancer risk for women who breastfeed their babies and the more you breastfeed, the more reduction in risk there is. So going back to the original claim, um, I think you can see that the data just isn't there to support the vast majority of these claims just yet. That's not to say you shouldn't breastfeed. Of course you should, if that's what you want to do. But I think you just need to be a wee bit more realistic about what the data actually tells us the benefits are. So moving on, a more recent claim is not just for the people involved, but breastfeeding is going to save the planet. Who knew all we needed was some boobs and we would have the environment saved? I'm being a wee bit facetious here, but basically there's a new theory that breastfeeding is much more environmentally friendly than formula feeding, so much so that the World Breastfeeding Alliance made the theme of World Breastfeeding Week in 2020 support breastfeeding for a healthier planet. Now, again, on the face of it, this makes perfect sense. Breast milk comes from breasts. It doesn't come most of the time in plastic bottles, unless you pump, obviously. Um, you know, you don't have to manufacture it. You don't need to use loads of water and transport it and plastic packaging, etc. So, you know, this seems to make sense. And there's no actually that much evidence in the literature. And in fact, the only paper that I could find, sorry, I've not actually put the, the reference in the slide here, but the, this was a paper by Joff et al. in the British Medical Journal that suggested that there were a number of environmental benefits of breastfeeding. And you can see that they posited that breastfeeding saves between 95 to 153 kilos carbon dioxide equivalent compared to formula feeding. If all babies were breastfed in the UK for just six months, we would reduce the carbon equivalent to taking between 50 to 77 and a half thousand cars off the road for a year. They also claimed that the estimated energy used to boil water for formula over a baby's first year equates to over 1.5 million kilos of CO2 and that formula cans cause up to 86,000 tonnes of metal and 364,000 tonnes of paper into landfill every year. Now when you look at that you think bloody hell formula feeding really is not good for the environment. But if you're a science geek like me and you want to go back to the original source and see what the evidence is for this, you might find that the evidence for this claim is not quite as clear as what it looks like here. So when I did do that and dug into the data, what I found was that, yep, there is a, a paper that showed that breastfeeding would save between 95 to 153 kilos of carbon compared to formula feeding but it was based on a mathematical equation where the researchers weighted the influence of each of the different components of formula because obviously formula is made up of lots of different components 
And when they adjusted the relative weighting of the different components of the formula, the results were different, as you would expect. So you were looking at kind of 12 to 36 percent reduction in the climate impact here measured by carbon, which was a lot less than what was reported in this study. And actually, when the authors actually adjusted the model based on the protein content of the formula and they assumed that there was no sterilisation of the bottles, it actually worked out that formula feeding was less, uh, used less carbon than, sorry, carbon was less for formula feeding than it was for breastfeeding. So basically, you know, what you put in influences what you get out of your mathematical model. So well, there is a possibility that breastfeeding is better in terms of the carbon footprint than formula feeding. There's quite a few variables that might end up negating or at least reducing that effect. So what about these cars then? Well, to be honest, I'm not really sure what, how they calculated that. So I went away and looked at how many babies were born in, um, in the UK and calculated it all up and we found that it was only about 23,000 fewer cars if we take the 95 to 153 kilo uh, uh, CO2 saving on breastfeeding as definite. So again it might be that much, it might not. In terms of using less energy to boil water I can't find any citation for this. The people that they used as evidence to cite it was a baby-friendly review and it had nothing in it about the energy to boil water. And if you Google how much energy does it take to boil a kettle of water, you will go down an internet rabbit hole that you probably really don't want to. So take it from me. Um, the answer is that it is very variable. It depends on how much water is in your kettle. It depends on the energy efficiency of your kettle. Um, it depends on the type of heating that you've got. Um, so do you make up your bottles individually or do you make them up in a batch? So many factors that influence this. I'm not really sure I would be able to stand by that claim. And then finally, in terms of the landfill, again, it wasn't um, actually measured. It was an uh, International Baby Food Action Network webpage, but that was 404 error, so I couldn't actually see what it said. Um, so I have no idea of what the value was, how many tins of formula are actually purchased in the UK. Most of them now are cardboard tubs, so I'm presuming that most folk would be recycling them, but who knows. So unfortunately, at the moment, while there possibly is the environmental benefit of breastfeeding, the data just doesn't stack up to support this claim. And it also doesn't take into consideration the requirement of food production for mums who are breastfeeding. So I think the recommended increase in calorie intake is 500 calories a day. So that's got to come from somewhere. So that food has got to be produced, transported, etc. Come in packaging, has to be cooked. So we need to take that into consideration. We also need to take into consideration that many women who breastfeed also pump breast milk and store it in plastic bags, plastic bottles, they heat it up. And many women now are breastfeeding for longer, up to two years and even more. So again, where do we stop? Do we go with the six months or do we look at the impact of breastfeeding for longer? Who knows? So the jury's out in this one. Um, Possibly there is an environmental benefit to breastfeeding, but at the moment I just can't see any data to support the claim. So next up then, it's not just claims about breastfeeding that are made in the infant feeding world. There are plenty of claims about the wonder of formula. Now I just want to point out that I have used these pictures that I took in my local supermarket I am not paid by Aptimil. I am not showing Aptimil and Cowan Gate here because they're sending me money. I've never received any money from any infant food manufacturer and I never will, unfortunately. Such is this topic that 
um, it wouldn't be a surprise if somebody claimed that I was shilling for Aptimil. I am not. It's just quite a nice picture. I thought, you know, with all the colours, almost like the rainbow. But anyway, you get what you pay for with formula, right? The dearer ones have got more ingredients in them. They're better for babies. And you can see there's a load of fantastic options on the market there for you. Unfortunately, that is wrong. The manufacturers would love you to think that, but there is no evidence to support any of the claims that more expensive formulas are better for babies. And also, if you've been down the formula aisle in your local supermarket, you probably have seen these things here. So you've got Aptimil Pro Futura. So this is Aptimil's premium brand. Um, you also have specific formulas for hungry baby. So down here on the bottom uh, left, you'll see hungry baby formula. So the claim for that type of formula is if your baby's hungry and it's eating all the time, this formula is slower to digest and will keep them fuller for longer. You've also got comfort formulas, which are said to relieve colic and constipation. You've got organic formula that claims to be nutritionally superior. And you've got anti-reflux formula here as well that helps babies who have reflux and who are spitting up their milk. And while there's plenty of anecdotal evidence from individual parents to say that these formulas have helped their babies, unfortunately, there is no robust scientific evidence to suggest that there actually is um, an effect. So... If you are dealing with a baby with reflux or colic or constipation or they seem to be hungry all the time, my advice would be don't go and pull one of these things off the shelf. Go and speak to your health visitor or your midwife because the data just isn't there to suggest that this is um, these things are doing what they say in the tin. They are not doing what they say on the tin. The other thing to point out as well in terms of the DERA formulas being perceived to be better and more nutritious is actually false as well because that um, formula is probably one of the most regulated foodstuffs on the planet. So the law actually sets out what the composition of formula should be. So you don't have to read the whole um, regulation. The take home message is, is that all infant formula must meet the same compositional requirements by law. So the cheapest formula in the market versus the dearest formula in the market are going to be nutritionally equivalent. So there's no need to spend £15 on a tub of Aptimil Pro Futura when you can get the same nutritional benefit for your baby with Aldi's Mamiya formula or one of the cheaper brands. So sorry formula companies but your claims just do not stack up and the data is not there to support. The one thing I'll mention as well, have we look at these two sets of pictures? So on the left hand side here we've got the Aptimil Pro Futura 1 and Pro Futura 2. Can you see anything different about these two tubs? So the one is what's called first infant milk. And that's suitable for babies from birth until 12 months old. And the two is the follow-on milk. And the same with a normal brand, you've got the first infant milk and then the follow-on milk. Any differences? If there's eagle-eyed people among you, you will have spotted that on the Pro Futura follow-on, the label is in gold. And there's some scientific looking um, pictures there, a wee diagram talking about some of the ingredients. Same in the normal one. The standard picture is just blue, but in the, the follow-on, it's gold, and there's some additional health claims made here about um, supporting a healthy immune system. Now, that's a bit cheeky on behalf of the formula manufacturers because they're prohibited from making claims that they cannot support, and they're actually prohibited from advertising or marketing first infant formula in such a way that entices parents to use their product or perhaps to choose formula feeding over breastfeeding. Although I'm not sure there's strong evidence that um, 
people who want to breastfeed would be enticed not to do so by the pictures in the front of a formula tin. But either way, you'll find that when the follow-on formula, um, which are not subject to the same market and guidelines, they can be a wee bit jazzier and a wee bit more relaxed with what they put on the tub. So we're starting to get into this area where they can make claims and try and make their products look superior. So if you kind of get over um, the rules, you can get around them. And just want to say as well, follow-on formulas aren't necessary. Um, babies can drink first infant milk until they're 12 months old. So again, it's just another way of flouting the rules and the, the formula manufacturers can be a bit cheeky in this sense. So I can see time is moving swiftly on, so I'll no linger too long on the rest. And this is something that I just wanted to put in, but I won't actually spend too much time on it, because I think for a sceptical audience, you'll be really aware of some of the limitations of the claims for natural remedies. So infant feeding is not immune to claims from homeopaths, chiropractors, naturalists, herb, naturalists, nat naturists. <laughs> natural herbs and other complementary alternative therapies. And this is just a troll of Twitter to show some of the, the claims that are made. So homeopathy can help you overcome your breastfeeding challenges. Cranial sacral therapy will help your baby that's got colic. Um, treatment for mastitis. Mastitis is a really painful, potentially serious infectious dis um, disease of the breast. And if you do not get treated, can potentially cause significant issues. And here they're suggesting rest, water, vitamin C, echinacea, garlic, topical turmeric and probiotics. I'm sorry, folks, if you have mastitis, you need to go to the GP and get antibiotics. Um, other things they're suggesting, I mentioned cranial sacral therapy, ginger, lemon balm for colic. I mean, as I say, I'm not going to spend any time debunking these because I'm preaching to the choir here. The one thing I'll point out um, is that Alison Stoib, at the time of tweeting these, I believe, was the head of the ABA, the American Breastfeeding Association. I'd need to double check exactly what association she was head of. So this is an infant feeding, a breastfeeding expert who is tweeting from a conference promoting chamomile for colic and garlic for mastitis. So it's no wonder that women who are having these problems end up taking these things and potentially resulting in harm. Which brings me on to my next question. And this is the question that us sceptics have to ask of any of this type of thing is what's the harm? So what if the NHS is promoting breastfeeding, surely you can try it and if it doesn't work out, just move on to formula. Nobody's been harmed. You know, breastfeeding is definitely not harmful and it's clearly beneficial in some ways and it might be beneficial in more ways than we know. So what is the harm? Well, again, considering the context that women are getting this message in, breastfeeding is good magical, something to be promoted, formula feeding is risky, artificial, not natural. It starts to build a picture of basically breastfeeding good, bottle feeding bad. And ultimately, it's a lose-lose situation for everybody. So some of the, the data that's asked women about their experiences of infant feeding has found that when your healthcare provider tells you something that's demonstrably not true, then it sows a seed of mistrust. So if healthcare providers are making all these bold claims about breastfeeding that we know the data isn't there to support, then the stuff that actually is true is going to get lost because, well, if they're lying about that, they might be lying about something else. Or if they're not even lying, just misinformed, um, you know, how can we trust them to be telling us the right information if we know that some of what they're telling us just doesn't have the evidence to support it? The other thing that is a huge issue in infant feeding, and it's why it's such a divisive subject to talk about sometimes, is that 
women who breastfeed or formula feed have huge feelings of shame and guilt. Um, if breastfeeding doesn't work out and you then have to go to formula feeding, you've gone from the magical, wonderful breastfeeding to the risky formula feeding. You've got this list of things that's, you know, you're increasing your baby's risk of all these terrible diseases. So women feel terrible about having to formula feed. Women who don't want to breastfeed in the first place for whatever reason also feel guilty that they're not breastfeeding as well. And that ultimately increases the incidence of depression or anxiety, feelings of shame and guilt in women at a really vulnerable time of their life. You know, when you've just had a baby and you're responsible for this new human being, um, it's, it's quite um, overwhelming. Obviously, things as well, like the alternative suggestions, if your baby's crying all the time with colic, give it some cranial sacral therapy. If you've got raging mastitis in your breast, slap a bit of garlic on it. That's not good health care for women or for babies. So if we tell women that all these alternative therapies that are not supported in the literature um, are valid treatments for their infant feeding issues, then we're going to end up having women and babies receiving poor health care. And ultimately, all of this is a disservice to women. <sighs> women are smart. Women are the experts in their lives. Women know their own bodies, their own babies, and they are the only people who have all of the information that they need to make the decision about how to feed their babies. And by effectively coercing them into choosing breastfeeding means that we are not giving them their due. We're infantilising them somewhat, you know. It's almost like we're saying if we give women the truth, some of them might choose to formula feed and we can't have that, so we need to get them. We need to really big up the breastfeeding so that women will choose breastfeeding. Um, but ultimately... At feed we trust women they're the experts in their own lives and they can make their own decisions with robust data as i say boob good bottle bad is the picture that's being built up around it and um, i talked a wee bit about the impact of this type of education on maternal and infant health outcomes so vicky fallon's work showed that actually in response to the Baby Friendly Initiative, there are no health outcomes being measured, so we don't actually know if that's improving things. And also that women really don't like it. It's not working for them. They feel pressured to breastfeed and they feel really bad if breastfeeding doesn't work. Another consequence of kind of demonising, strong words, but demonising formula is for families living in food poverty. So a lot of the work we've done at Feed has focused on maternal and infant food insecurity. And we were really, really shocked to discover that UNICEF, who um, the Baby Friendly Initiative, recommend that food banks don't give out formula because, as you can see there, the quote from their policy, it's due to concerns for safety of the baby. So if you're living in a world where breastfeeding is best, for want of a better term, and formula is seen as being risky, and dangerous, then of course you're not going to want food banks to hand out formula willy-nilly. But unfortunately, there's there's no evidence to suggest that formula feeding is inherently risky. And what's happening now because of these policies is that formula-fed babies who are living in food poverty are going without food because it's taking them longer to source, taking their parents and carers longer to source um, formula for them. And Sorry, I couldn't go into that in a, a wee bit more detail, but I realise I'm I'm running over time here. So I just put that wee picture of my wee one um, drinking his iron brew because sure, if sometimes it feels like you might as well just give them some good old iron brew made in Scotland from girders. So just to finish off then, what is the solution to all of this? Well, at Feed, we think we need good science. We need science-based policy and support for women to make sure that they are getting unbiased information to 
to ensure that they can make the infant feed decisions that best suit themselves. We also need more evidence and data to support practical solutions for common infant feeding problems, and we need to do more to tackle the confounders. Things that might improve food poverty, eradicate poverty, improve infant and child health out with just the feeding, look at education and social economic status. If we can go downstream a wee bit and fix some of those problems that we do know from the randomised studies and the sibling studies that have an impact, then we will be able to improve outcomes for women and babies. And ultimately, we need to respect women, give them the information that we've got robust data for and support them in whatever decisions they make for themselves. And I will say that organisations like the NHS, UNICEF, La Leche etc., they are really pulling back on some of these more um, unsubstantiated claims. Now, this was one of the posters in the maternity unit, and it, it seems to be that, as I say, the more unsubstantiated claims are dropping off these posters. But in the World Wide Web, you know, you've still got those glossy-haired breastfed babies. So there is still a lot of work to do, and at Feed we are trying very hard to do it. And I hope that has... Um, convinced you that the world of infant feeding is a sceptic's dream and to join us on busting some more of these myths. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. I'll finish off with my reproductive biologist joke. Where do reproductive biologists go to hang out? The discharge lounge. <laughs> so thank you very much for that and I'm sure we'll be back after the break with lots of questions. Um, thank you so much, Erin. That was amazing. Um, there's been lots of banter in the text chat. We've already got a bundle of questions. I'm sure we'll get more as we work our way up past through the break. So, folks, if you haven't already asked a question and you want to, or you want to upvote something, go to sitp.online forward slash ask. Quick reminder while I'm here, our next talk, two weeks today, 28th of July, a brilliant follow on from today. It's Growing Up Human, the Evolution of Childhood uh, with Brenna Hassett. And remember as well, also after tonight's talk, you can join us in our Zoom pub, the Lock-Ins Razor. So now it's time to grab yourselves a bottle uh, or a breast, uh, I suppose, as long as you've got consent. So uh, go and refresh yourselves and we will see you after the break. Okay, we are back and ready for the Q&A. You have been expressing yourselves beautifully um, in, the, in the Slido area there. So... Let's get stuck in. Welcome back, uh, Aaron. We're going to kick off with the first question from Paul, a.k.a. Picticule. I gather some mothers are unable for various reasons to breastfeed, so resort to formula. Interpreting this as a failing, can this attitude be counteracted? That is a good question, and it's definitely right to say that a lot of people feel that they've failed when they have to move on to formula. And there's a whole re number of reasons why somebody wouldn't be able to breastfeed. They could have problems breastfeeding for whatever reason, might need medications that are contraindicated. Of course, you've then got women who have maybe had mastectomy or they've been the victim of sexual abuse and they don't feel comfortable breastfeeding. So we're always going to have a group of women for whom breastfeeding is not best. And I think the only way to stop this feeling of failure is to stop putting forward breastfeeding as this magical, wonderful, lovely, smiley, happy option and formula as being risky, second best and increasing the risk of all these health issues. Because one thing I didn't touch on in the talk was... Um, there's a push from some people in the infant feeding world to use what they call risk language. So we shouldn't talk about the benefits of breastfeeding. We should talk about the risks of formula feeding. So we shouldn't say breastfeeding will lower your risk of breast cancer. We should say formula feeding will increase your risk of breast cancer. So it's almost like frightening women away from formula feeding. And it's absolutely no wonder how folk feel terrible if they have to formula feed when that's how it's being sold to us as a package during our antenatal experience. So I think a, a kind of unbiased approach 
Here is the information about formula. Here is the information about breastfeeding. You can do either or or a combination of both, which we always ignore. Um, and we'll support you whatever way you choose. I think that's the way forward. So, I mean, there, the need for some kind of balance and in, in messaging there, right? I certainly yeah. wouldn't encourage a, uh, that, that sort of risk-based messaging anyway, for sure, right? Mm. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Next one from a guest. Uh, is healthcare starting to include other genders in their breastfeeding narratives, e.g. beyond traditional female form uh, and, and use of the word women? Absolutely. The good thing about infant feeding now is it's, I mean, it really is an individual approach. So each woman's circumstances, I'm using the word women, <laughs> is going to be different. Each person's circumstances is going to be different. So when healthcare providers and infant feeding specialists are approaching people, they're doing it at an individual level. So I tend to use the term women because that's the vast majority of who we support in terms of infant feeding however we are aware that people might not identify as women maybe identify differently and we're absolutely beginning in fact there's been quite a, a, a bigger increase in using more gender neutral language discussing chest feeding instead of breastfeeding or you know addressing people on an individual basis how they prefer to be addressed and ultimately, if you want to build a good relationship between yourself and the person that you're supporting, I think that's really important to do that. Okay. That's maybe like a slow moving ship, though. It's kind of hard to get those those sort of terms out of your head if there's new terminology, though, right? Is that going to, I mean, do we, do we think that's going to start showing up in, you know, the documentation we get, like in the baby boxes in the near future? Or is it more along the lines of like individual conversations to start with? I think it's a wee bit of both. There are, you know, some infant feeding organisations, particularly the NHS as well, are starting to introduce gender neutral language. It's a wee bit of a contentious issue because many women feel that they want to retain terms like mother breastfeeding woman, whereas people that don't identify that way prefer gender neutral. So I think it's just about using... Um, you know, maybe women and other lactating people or, you know, whatever terms people are comfortable with to include everybody rather than exclusion of one or the other. Understandable. OK, next question is from Cleo. Um, is fashion as relevant in infant feeding as in everything else? Uh, I remember being unnecessarily encouraged to top up with a bottle uh, and that's anxiety provoking too. Absolutely. I think that is ultimately you've hit the nail on the head because there was so much push to bottle feed kind of in the 70s roughly. And of course, anybody that's um, familiar with the infant feeding world know that the formula manufacturers, particularly Nestle, had some really dodgy dealings where they went to um, low to middle income countries and convinced women to formula feed and then they didn't have clean water or they didn't have the facilities so it actually caused a huge amount of um, damage to infant health there so I feel like to try and combat that we are now trying to promote breastfeeding but it's almost like the pendulum has swung too far in the opposite direction so it does it kind of kind of comes and goes as to I suppose the fashion is, is one way of putting it so what I really want to see is a happy medium where we can be honest about the benefits of breastfeeding we can be honest about formula feeding and some of the unscrupulous activities that the formula companies um, undertake and we can just give women the information they need without putting a kind of value judgment on what they should do so I, I think you're absolutely right we were at that end of the scale couple of decades ago we're at this end of the scale now and we just need to bring it back to the middle yeah i, I was a i was a 70s baby as you can probably tell by my not very shiny hair right <laughs> that's it i knew straight away <laughs> i would say for the audience as well like if uh, if you're a podcast listener check out behind the bastards there's an excellent episode of that that talks about nestle's skullduggery with regards to mm -hmm. uh, feeding um you know a number of decades ago 
Um, okay, next question from Slava Ukraini. Uh, I read that food banks aren't being allowed to give out baby formula, even though people can't afford to buy it. How can we help change this? You kind of touched on that towards the end of your presentation anyway, but is there is there pressure to try and change that? Because it's, you know... Uh, it, it's a thorny topic, right? But we don't want we don't want children going hungry, right? That's right. Well, first of all, I want to make it perfectly clear that formulas are allowed to give out. It, food banks are allowed to give out formula, so there is no law that prevents any charity from receiving donations of formula and giving it out to formula-fed babies. However, the confusion has come in because the UNICEF UK Baby Friendly Initiative in 2014 wrote guidelines for food and baby banks that said they should not give out formula. And what's happened then is that this has been interpreted as that they're not allowed to do it. And we started working in this field when we got contacted for baby banks saying we've been giving out formula because there's babies starving and the infant feeding lead for the local health board has come and told us we're breaking the law, which actually isn't true. We've also been working with health boards and they're really wary of supporting the provision of formula at food banks because they're concerned for their baby friendly accreditation status and they feel that they need to be abiding by the UNICEF guidelines even though they're completely voluntary. So we're in this kind of postcode lottery now where if the food or baby bank near you decides not to implement the UNICEF guidelines then you can go there and get formula if they decide to implement them or if they mistakenly believe them to be binding by law, then you'll not be able to get infant formula. So we're seeing more and more reports of babies going without for a day or two or longer until other means of access to formula can, can be put in place. So it is a big issue. I think what we can do to stop it is just to, well, you could share the feed guidelines for Food and Baby Banks that's on our website, which make it very clear that it's fine to donate and provide formula for formula-fed babies. And also there's some information in there about providing only first infant formula because we know that that's suitable for all babies and it's nutritionally equivalent regardless of the brand. And okay. there's also information about supporting breastfeeding mums with food packages and things as well. And it just about spread in the world making sure that food and baby banks know that they can do it. But also, on a longer term level, we need to start working together to... We need a long term solution to food poverty, basically, and food banks are not it. And FEED have been working with some local authorities and academics to try and come up with solutions to the problem. But for now, until we do that, we need to widen the access routes. And, you know, there's families, like refugee families, who have got no recourse to public funds. There's families who are what they call the working poor, who are in work, so they're not eligible for benefits, but the cost of living crisis is hitting us all hard. Mm -hmm. um, and you've also got vulnerable groups like women living with HIV who are medically recommended to formula feed, but are more likely to be living in poverty. So there's all these people being disadvantaged. Um, so I would just need to get the message out that food and baby banks can provide formula. And if you have got the wherewithal to do it, stick a tub of first infant formula in your local food bank's collection tub. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that as well. And and that kind of highlights, you know, the the the, the counterproductive nature of, of the manufacturers there. Because if somebody thinks, well, I need I need a an infant formula with a number two on it and that one there's got a number one on it, I can't take it. Yes, you can, right? Mm. So uh, that's such a shame. Um, so, yeah, stick some formula milk in your local um, food donations part, folks, if you can. Definitely. Okay, um, next one from Anonymous. What motivation do UNICEF, etc., have for pushing breastfeeding without evidence? There doesn't seem to be any money in it. Are they trying to impose morality? I'll maybe add a little bit to that. Like, I, I, I mean, you went through some of the evidence and it was maybe questionable so maybe if we can rephrase that and say do you think UNICEF have been swayed by that questionable evidence or do you think they're aware that the evidence is questionable and they're, they have ulterior motives please speculate mm, well I would totally agree with you that it's not 
so much lack of evidence. It's just that the evidence we have for some of the claims that's been made is a wee bit, as we see up here in Scotland, on a sugarly peg. Um, there is evidence for some of the claims that's made reduced infections in the first year of life, which, you know, that's not a negligible thing. That's a really important and great benefit. And individual women will feel that breastfeeding brings them other benefits that maybe formula wouldn't on a more practical level when we talk about things like no having to sterilise and worry about formula and all that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of there being no monetary gain in it for UNICEF, I'm not entirely sure that's true because the NHS actually have to pay them for the training and the accreditation. Now, how much they pay them, we don't actually know because that's no publicly available information. But certainly UNICEF, um, I believe, are not providing training and resources and accreditation for free. So the NHS is spending money um, paying UNICEF for their services. In terms of the morality, oh, I don't know. I mean, do you know, I, I think that we're all just trying to achieve the same goal which is happy mums happy babies we just disagree on how best to do it and I kind of feel like some of the newer evidence like the Vicky Fallon review that showed that there's, in the UK setting at least there's no that much strong evidence right now for the advantage of the baby friendly initiative I don't know whether I can see how, as UNICEF, you would dig your heels in against that. And I, I truly believe, maybe I'm naive, but that everybody is working towards what they think is the best for mums and babies. Um, and as I say, I, I, we're just different on how, how we should best do that. But I'm a scientist. I think we should be led by the evidence, the science, the data. Um, and as much as that hurts sometimes to accept that your hypothesis isn't quite as strong as you thought it was or your um, intervention isn't getting you as good a results as what you thought it was, you've just got to suck it up and take it in the chin and go back to the drawing board and, and see what you can come up with. So I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question, but... Well, well, look, we got we got we got a follow on here anyway from Arthur, right? If breastfeeding adds to the mummy magic, you get scare quotes for that. Um, the mummy magic effect and gives real benefits. Isn't it justifiable to use even weekly scientific evidence to persuade people to breastfeed? I think the the whole point in that question to me is the word persuade. And it depends on where you sit and believing we should persuade women to do something with their bodies or not. Now, I'm a bit of a feminist, so I think we, sh you know, we should trust women to make the decisions. If the evidence is weak, tell me that the evidence is weak and then I will make my decision based on that evidence. COVID is a perfect example. Some folk decided to get vaccinated, some folk didn't, because for one group of people, the evidence for vaccination in terms of what the potential side effects were was enough to take that risk. For other folk, they thought, no, that's too much a risk for me. And I think that's what we should apply to breastfeeding. So I don't think we should be trying to persuade anybody to do anything. I think we should be giving them the unvarnished truth. Here are the clear benefits here are the things that we think might be a benefit, but we're not quite sure of the data. And here are the things that we know are not going to be affected. You take that away and we will sit and talk it through with you and you can make up your own mind. Mm -hmm. That's the best way, I think, that, that we should be doing it. Um, you know, I'm with you on that. Aye, based on the science, based on the science. All right. Uh, another anonymous question. Do you agree there needs to be more education and acceptance to allow people to breastfeed in public? Do you think that would help people breastfeed for longer? Absolutely. I mean, that is one thing that we see in surveys and when we talk to women, it makes them nervous about breastfeeding, particularly maybe in front of like older relatives, especially men. I mean, I wouldn't have breastfed in front of my dad. And again, that's a personal thing. Um, and when you see some of the ridiculous 
the things that happen to folk when they're breastfeeding, you know, being asked to cover up or go to the toilet. Ultimately, again, you know, we're protected by law, breastfeeding, and in Scotland, formula feeding is protected by law. Nobody can ask you to cover up, go away, date somewhere else. Um, so I think that's something that we absolutely should be encouraging. Um, at the same time, you know, if you do feel a wee bit bashful about it or you're not quite as confident, then it's great that we do have things like breastfeeding covers or specific areas and public places that are a wee bit more discreet. So it's about supporting women to be confident in feeding their babies whenever they need to and wherever they need to. So I absolutely think that that's something we need to tackle. Yeah, it's interesting. Now, I mean, you see, you see that popping up on social media from time to time. Somebody being made to feel uncomfortable, and it, it's it's so disappointing, you know. I think I think everybody rational realizes that it's a perfectly natural thing. That's to- that. I mean, nobody's complaining when it's. I don't know. I'm showing my age now, but you know, Eva Herzegova with the jeans and the Wonder Bra. You know, nobody's complaining about their boobs been out in billboards in public. But as soon as there's a baby attached to it, somehow it's like, oh, get that away from me. <laughs> so we need to just, you know, stop annoying folk that are just feeding their babies. Sure. Okay. Next question from Cat Likes Jam. Why do you think low SES is related to less breastfeeding? Surely it's the more cost-effective option. What is influencing this relationship? Oh, that is a really good question. Um, I think that women in lower socioeconomic status probably work in jobs where they might not have the flexibility to feed Um, So, for example, if you worked for home as a childminder, you can quite easily feed your baby. If you've got flexibility to take breaks and pump breast milk and your workplace has an area for you to do that and to store milk, then you're going to be more supported to continue breastfeeding. But if you work, you know, behind the till at the local spa, the chances are that you're probably not going to be able to do that. So um, I think a lot of it is to do with the need to go back to work sooner to support the family and the support in the workplace. There's probably a whole host of other um, issues as well that I can't think of off the top of my head. Um, One thing I will say is that women who are living in food poverty and who only actually eating enough nutritious food themselves get really concerned that their breast milk is going to be nutritious enough and that they're going to produce enough breast milk to support their baby's growth. So they're often more comfortable moving to formula because they know what the baby's getting and that it's got all the vitamins and minerals. So again, it's about supporting women um, that are living in food poverty or, or have food insecurity to be able to continue breastfeeding. And we know that women in food insecurity need more help to continue breastfeeding as well. So there's a whole lot. Of, I feel like it's like unpicking, you know, a ball, a string. As soon as you start picking at some threads, it, it all just unravels. There's so many different integrating factors that might influence it. But I, I think, as I said in the talk, if you if you go downstream for the feeding and start to tackle some of the issues that influence how a woman might feed her baby then we might actually start to see some stronger um, improvements in both maternal and infant health for sure i mean my, when my wife was breastfeeding like her her calorie intake was just through the roof right mm. Could you eat it? and you know if you're struggling to to to, to meet that intake it, it kind of makes sense it's, it's an absolute heartbreaker though right mm. Yeah, I mean, you need the time to be able to dedicate to breastfeeding and the resources to be able to bre- dedicate to breastfeeding. And women in lower socioeconomic status don't have as much time and resources. Mm, for sure. Um, OK, moving on. Monica asks, did the study you quoted with siblings control for the con- confounding factor of birth order? Oh, that is a good question. And I don't actually know the answer off the top of my head. I would imagine not, although I can't say for sure without going back and checking the paper, because I would imagine that probably it would be, I don't, 
think it would be that easy to get families where one sibling has been breastfed and one sibling hasn't at least had some breastfeeding. Yeah. But I'm sorry, I don't actually know the answer. The other thing that I thought about about that study as well is that if a baby is not breastfed, there could be other reasons that the you know that lead to the re- lead to them not being breastfed that might influence outcomes as well. So For you know, sure. right. there's other health issues, or maybe they had a cesarean, or yeah, or you know you've got an extra child in the house that you've got less less uh-huh. money to uh, yeah. less money to kick about. You've got less time in your hands. You exactly. know. Mm. different behaviour factors is, is the more children you have, you know. Yeah. Uh, and on the, the other side as well, you've, in my experience was I breastfed my second baby less than my first baby because I had issues the first time and I really didn't want to do it. So uh-huh. my breastfed baby and my non-breastfed baby are probably no that different. Um, Which so has just, been your hair? Well, that's it, I <laughs> Smoother so skin. Maybe we can tell a difference, right? <laughs> Just uh, stroke their skin and you'll see. <laughs> exactly. Unless some of them are discreetly using conditioner behind your back. Right, OK. Next one from Jessica. Um, do you think more people just wing it when it comes to feeding babies uh, kinds of foods and milk, or do they dogmatically adhere to baby books more? We just winged it. Good on you, Jessica, for winging it. <laughs> assuming it worked out well. I'm saying good on you, Jessica. Uh, I'm assuming your child, children turned out okay, Jessica. I really hope they <laughs> So what, what do you reckon? And I mean, the, the manual kind of does get chipped out of the window pretty early on after you have kids, right? And let, even more so with, with, you know, child two and onwards. So what do you mm. reckon? I think it's probably a bit of both and somewhere in between. So we see people who are so dogmatically stuck on breastfeeding that even when things are going wrong, that they, they, they still feel like they should be breastfeeding. And sometimes it can end up in really horrible outcomes like the baby has hypoglycemia or they're not getting enough milk. And if you, you know, if you, if you Google it, um, you'll find, you know, first-person accounts of things like that that's happened. So they've gone through that antenatal education. They're so adamant that they must breastfeed, um, which is completely understandable when you think back to that context and how infant feeding is presented. Um, And then it ends up causing readmissions for things like hypoglycemia, jaundice and stuff like that. So there is a big concern that this push for exclusive breastfeeding, and I forgot to mention that 10 steps to successful breastfeeding, the number six that said no food or fluids other than breast milk unless medically indicated. Yeah, that is well, being that, that's scary yeah, tell, right? That is, yeah, scary. So, I mean, medically indicated is... You know, jaundice, hypoglycemia. You don't really want to, to get to that point before you do something like that. And another one I've seen people being really, you know, staunch about is baby led weaning. So this is where you shouldn't be feeding um, purees and things. It must only be the same kind of food as mum and dad. And I've seen cases where, you know, babies just can't eat a carrot. So, they, you know, they just mush it about their mouth and then slurry it over the f- couch or something and then the baby starts to lose weight on the other hand <laughs> then you've got the winging it I'm, <laughs> I'm, in, <laughs> I'm in the kind of winging it crowd as well um I'm not do you know what I think when my first baby I started off I'm breastfeeding I'm breastfeeding I'm breastfeeding and I just put myself through so much pain and then kind of gave up and thought for want a better phrase I don't know if I'm allowed to say naughty words but you can say no as much as you want. <laughs> um, I, I just thought, oh, I, I just can't I keep doing this. And then I just became in the wing it crowd. And one place where we do see people winging it is with the formula preparation. So NHS tells us every bottle should be made from scratch with water boiled and cooled to 70 degrees. Now at three o'clock in the morning, how many folk are actually going to be, you know, have a crying baby in one arm and, you know, waiting 20 minutes so a lot of mums we've spoke to either 
make batches of formula and then just stick it in the microwave or they buy the formula machines where they can kind of press a button and it pops it um, at the right temperature. Some folk make it with cold water. I mean, there's if people just go completely off script, um, including paediatricians and paediatric nurses. Some of the stories they tell me about things that they've done with feeding their babies. I must say that you should always adhere to the NHS guidelines for safe formula preparation. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, uh, there's definitely the wing in it. I mean, the it crowd. We can go down a whole like crazy avenue here, right? But oh, I... maybe we could just say, like, you know, I, I guess you have to take into account the physical and mental health of the parents as well, right? Because, you know, trying to get get some food into your child so that your child will sleep a little bit, so that you can sleep a little bit means there's less chance of you falling asleep at the wheel when you drive to work the next day, right? So, exactly. you know, there, I mean, I think got, there's, there's balances to be had, right? Exactly. And I've got a personal theory, not backed by science, um, that we're, we all get fixated in something. So I had a friend that was sterilising. Um, another friend, it was complete darkness and silence for the baby sleeping. You know, we, we all kind of have something that we get kind of fixated on. And it's totally normal because you go for, you know, just having to worry about yourself to being handed this tiny wee pink mulein baby and being responsible for it. And it's totally overwhelming. You've got the hormones flying. You know, it's no wonder we get a wee bit kind of, um, when it comes to it. But I think eventually we all just find our own way and we'll be sticking to the rules in some things and winging it elsewhere. But the best parent advice I ever got for one of my pals who uh, runs a nursery, so she's got a fair level of experience looking after kids, is never start something you can't keep up. So there you go. That advice is for free. There you go. I <laughs> think that was a well digression. There you are, folks. You're listening to uh, Baby Chat with Erin and Brian. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. Um, question from Anonymous. Um, a difficult case is where mothers produce very small amounts of breast milk, perhaps only when pumping. How do we decide when it isn't worth persisting? That is a really personal question. Um, Me and Kate, who is one of the other co-founders of Feed, both experienced really low milk production. And she persisted and added in formula alongside breastfeeding um, and both our babies as well had a dairy allergy, so she cut out dairy for her diet. My decision was just to stop trying to pump and breastfeed and switch completely to formula. And I certainly wasn't giving up dairy either. <laughs> I was like, I'm uh-huh. sorry, I just can't get rid of the cheese. Um, so again, it comes back to that decision of persuading folk, you should do this or you should do that. Two people having the same experience are going to make the decisions that work best for them and I think it's just a, a personal decision for sure okay um, we've reached the end of the road this is the last question Erin so let's let's make it a stormer um, big takeaway of your talk should we encourage breastfeeding or should we look at the whole infant nurturing process differently as a, as a plurality oh that's a great question um Again, it's kind of coming back to this idea of encouraging. And I kind of remember who said it. So apologies to the person whose quote I'm going to nick here. But I was listening to somebody talking about infant feeding one day and she said, we need to encourage women who breastfeed and not encourage women to breastfeed. So there's a very subtle but really important difference. So again, our whole perspective at FEED is that we should present women with the information, tell them the truth about the strength of the data for the claims or the benefits of one method over another. Let them take that in in the context of their own life and their own experience and then really support and encourage them no matter what choice they make. So that's where I think we need to land in that. I think so. I think so. All right. 
Um, we're going to have to end it there, Aaron. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you coming to speak for us, folks. Please go wild in the text chat and Twitch <laughs> there for our speaker tonight. It's been an absolute fantastic journey. So, folks, uh, just a quick reminder: our next talk is two weeks today, twenty eighth of July. It is growing up human: the evolution of childhood with Brenna Hassett, and also. After tonight's show, you are more than welcome to come and join us in our virtual pub, the Lock-Ins Razor, our Zoom room. Um, I'm going to be in there giving you slightly drunken, incoherent um, Scottish parenting tips if you want. We can go to a breakout room and I can talk through all sorts of lovely stuff there. Just want to say a quick thanks to Igor and Laurie on the tech side and Kat for being the wind beneath my wings as backup MC, helping things run nice and smoothly tonight. So, folks, hope you've enjoyed yourselves. See you next time. Take away.